Okay, so that's that's some of these, you know, interactive websites that you will have come across. What about some stuff that you might have seen? So there is a program that was released in the late, late 90s called Compass, and it was designed to figure out, to be a tool for policing units, to figure out who to let out, uh, not policing, sorry, judicial um, entities, to decide who to let out on, on bail. So a criminal comes along, you say, well, should this person stay in jail or should they be released until they're caught dead? So what do you need to figure out? Well, what's the chance of, of sort of reoffending or doing something nasty? Right? You don't want someone running around the streets and doing something nasty. So you don't want them to have bail. But if someone's quite safe to society, you don't really mind them having bail. It's cheaper, actually. So somebody came up with a, a really, really, really clever algorithm, which I'll, which I'll describe shortly. <laughs> and that was being used to decide who, who gets bail. And then someone realized, well, if we can, if we can figure out you know, the chance of someone reoffending to compute bail, why don't we use this to compute parole as well? Same idea. So you start with bail. So, well, we can use it to figure out how long someone should have to be on parole. Same tool. And someone else said, well, that's great, but well, when else do we make decisions about people who got in jail or we sentence them? So we can use the same tool to decide how long to sentence them for. So something that was originally designed for a very, very, very short period of that bail. You don't spend that long on bail. You need to do a bail. Well, some cases do, but mostly don't. That they got reassigned to computing parole periods and then reassigned to computing sentences. So an algorithm which was designed with one, in with one intention got quickly shifted to something else. <coughs> I wonder whether the developers of this realized that could even happen. Now, so this is a really clever algorithm, highly, highly sophisticated. So the way it works is you ask the person a 137 question multi choice, and then you've computed some parameters from previous prison data that you've got for some district, and then you compute a weighted sum. And this gives you your chance of, of, of reoffending. That's a highly, highly sophisticated mathematics. <laughs> well, no, this is, this, is, this is a joke. Well, when I say joke, it means something happened. But the fact that it's happening like this is a joke. But this brings me to one point. When you're using an algorithm, it is an algorithm, it's a crappy one, but it's an algorithm. Just like the jail, jail, jail algorithm is an algorithm, pretty crappy one, but I could use that if I want. <laughs> off with their head. Here's an algorithm. You start to move decision making into the land of mathematics. And then people think, oh, well, the algorithm is doing it. It's done mathematically. Mathematicians are smart. Look, look how smart we are. We're incredibly smart. Look, look in the mirror. Look, 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 look how clever you are. Oh, they all look together. Look, well, because they're using math, the algorithm, well, it must be fair. It must be impartial. Because it's math. Math can't be unfair, it's, it's just math, right? Well, who made the math? Who designed it? Who designed these 137 questions? So some collection of people decided on this set of 137 questions to ask. And then they used various information and training data from, 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 from police records to... Actually, what they do is they gave the survey to existing criminals in jail. I don't know how. I, <laughs> what are criminals known for? Being dishonest. It's kind of a criminal type trait, right? So I was like, here, please fill out this form you know, to, as honestly as you can. Sure, they will. Definitely trust them. And then you compute your, 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 your weights, these AIs, and then you sum it all up. It's all math. It's all impartial. No problems here. <laughs> Another system was developed called HART. And this was to decide, this is actually slightly sophisticated. It was done 
uh, by someone in Durham Police in conjunction with someone here in Cambridge. And so this is designed to see whether people being, char being charged with a crime should, rather than going through the judicial process, go through some other process. I think it's what it's called. I used to remember this. Somewhere here. It is called checkpoint. So rather than going through the whole judicial process, there's sort of like a, 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 a sort of judicial process light, just one calorie. Okay? So, so it's a very light touch way of, of, of punishing people. And the aim is to sort of prop, like really reintegrate them society and, and, and rather than like sending them to jail and harding them up and going through the whole court procedure, it's sort of a, an easier and softer way to put people through some sort of punishment system, mostly aimed at, at rehabilitating them. Some people this sort of works sort of really well, and some people, nah, not so well. There are actually some crimes where you can't do this. For example, for murder, you can't say, well, actually, we'll just give you a little pat on the back and then counsel it once a week, we'll surely be fine. No, it doesn't work for crimes like that. But for some crimes, you can, you, you can put people through this, uh, this protocol checkpoint. So hard is designed to quickly filter through people to decide whether they should go to checkpoint or not. So it actually does some, some, some serious machine learning. And it runs, it's like, well, which, which machine learning should, 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 should we do on this? How should we design it? How should we build it? I'm not really sure. So they run 509, God knows how they came to this number, 509 different machine learning algorithms. And then each of these gives an answer, basically yes or no. It's actually three things. It's uh, no, they won't re-offend, yes, they will re-offend non-violently, yes, they will re-offend violently. So I think it's something like, if it's no, they won't re-offend, they go through the criminal justice system, and if it's they'll re-offend, re but non-violently, they go through heart or something like this. <laughs> and they go I'll tell you what happens. So, so, so each of these 509 machine learning algorithms gives a vote out of these three options. Three options. So what do we do? Well, all these 509 things have a vote. So we count votes. And then we take first part of <laughs> Because this does seem really funny that you're letting algorithms vote on things. What other entities do we allow to vote on things in the world? People. Well, even people in non democracies. I mean, you can vote for a dictator, it's a pretty easy process. <laughs> Put the one in the box. This is the box. <laughs> no, Some safety systems. So safety systems, people, 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 people. We're almost, we're almost treating these algorithms as people by giving them a vote. We're almost treating them as as a independent decision making entity. Yet we say that all this is fair and impartial. We're building a voting system, little, 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 little machines. Yeah, but there, there, there are people voting. Yeah. People voting in, in, in different things. <coughs> Another system I was going to describe to you is something known as Red Bull, predictive policing. It's a tool for police to decide where to send units and resources. A tool that, that, that claims, and I have no idea how this works because it's a totally black box, claims, and it's actually an important point, but something's a black box, how do you know what it's doing? We'll discuss this later. But this thing claims to be able to tell police officers, send a car of, 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 of four officers here, or you know, there's going to be a, a small crime here, a medium crime here, and it sort of comes up on a little map, these little boxes up here saying, crime's coming, crime's coming, crime's coming, no idea how this works. No idea how this works because they don't release the, the 
the code for it. But even if you don't know how it works, you know roughly how they came to these sorts of conclusions, which is they take data about policing and they run it through, figure out whether there'll be more crimes happening. So what do you get when you send, you know, when it says, send a car with five policemen to this area? Well, you flood this area with five policemen, there's not a much higher chance that they'll catch a crime. Maybe not the crime you thought they were going to catch, but someone, you know, <laughs> someone figures to pick up a dog pool on the street or something. So they, 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 they catch a crime. So that ups the amount of crime that, that, that this algorithm thinks is happening over here. So next time it says send six policemen there and send them twice as often. And so you can catch people jaywalking, and, and so you get this massive feedback. Massive feedback. And this is actually an important phenomenon that we need to understand as mathematicians. That once we design these systems that are going to loop back on themselves, we create feedback loops that can blow up really quickly. And actually, mathematicians are studying this. Yeah. And I found a paper recent, a 2018 paper actually, where some mathematicians, computer scientists, it's called Runaway Feedback Loops in Predictive Policing. And they actually talk about Pimpol. And this is a CEDAC computer science paper. Properly trying to analyze what do these feedback loops do. Because I'm sure the people designing Redpole aren't trying to harm anyone, they're trying to provide a tool to be used. If you give this tool to police departments, most of which are strapped for cash and resources, take the UK's police departments, for example, they've suffered cut after cut after cut for the last eight years. And you give them a tool that says, here's where you want your police to be most effective. And this thing costs a couple of bucks compared to the actual cost of police officers. What are they going to do? It's too easy. It's too convenient. People are lazy. People don't want to do work. Don't want to spend money. They will use your tool. Whether it's right or wrong, and that's actually an important question. How do I know if this is wrong? How do I know when it's right? What does it mean to be right and wrong when they're really predictive policing? If you can't properly even test whether this can be right and wrong, you give people a convenient tool and say, this will solve all your problems, they will use it. And it'll feed back on itself and be self-reinforcing. Look, we caught, caught lots of crime in the place where we said to send 20 policemen. Well, of course you caught crime, because you sent 20 policemen. You can send 20 policemen to Pavilion C and they'll catch crime. No? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's obvious that's what's going to happen. It's obvious to us, as a mathematician. Not so obvious to people who take the train. So these, these, these things sort of generated some controversy, and so people are trying to study them. If, in particular, they're trying to study you know, what it means for something to be, to, 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 to be fair. Because you know, is, is uh, this one was called compass. Is compass actually giving a fair prediction, a fair outcome for how long to jail someone for? Is Hart giving a fair prediction of who should go to this sort of judicial light system. Is Predpol giving a fair prediction of where, where crime is going to be? So some computer scientists and mathematicians came along and said, right, we can do this. We can solve fairness mathematically. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so when I get up, when I, when I wake up in the morning, I think to myself, what, 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 does, what, does, what, what does fair mean? I mean, you know, philosophers have thought about fairness for the last 4,000 years, and they've, they've really scratched their heads about it. But hey, we, we know math, right? So, so we can, we got this, we can do this. So, so I, I wake up in the morning, and of course the first thing I think is, well, obviously, a fair, a fair algorithm is clearly a bi Lipschitz map between two metric spaces. <laughs> um, uh, called a control sample and decision sample uh, with epsilon and delta chosen well, some definition of well. That's clearly what I think of as fairness when I get up in the morning. That's obviously what it means to be fair. <laughs> no, that, 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 that's, that's possibly the most ridiculous thing I, I've come across in the three years I've been doing ethics and math. That we can classify fairness by a bi shift map between metric spaces. And I'll explain this more in the discussion session if you want. 
<laughs> Paul explains. <laughs> but this is what we think we can do. We have power algorithms, have math. That means we can solve all societal problems. Thousands of years we've worked on what fairness means. And now we've solved it in two lines of metric space and topology. I'm guessing they've missed something here. Just, 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 just putting that there. I'm guessing that there's a few subtle points here that they've missed. So they, they, they actually take a, a list of conditions of what it means to, to, for, for an algorithm to, to, to be fair. They take reasonable assumptions that are there. Fairness means this, and sort of set split like this, and stuff like that. Okay? Maybe that's the way you want to do it. And once they've got these formalized definitions, they can then do, they can then do math. Fine, great, you do whatever you want in free time, I don't care. Do some math if you want. But then they claim that, that, that these are actual proper ways to verify whether things are fair or unfair. Okay. No. That's a way to verify whether your mathematical conditions hold. Actual fairness, much more complicated notion. Two artifact, artifacts come out of this. Firstly, is that well, it turns out that fair, fair of fair might not equal fair. In other words, put two fair things together and that come unfair. Explain that to your your cousins when you go home for Christmas. You got a fair thing. It's a fair process. Not a fair process. Run them one after the other. That's obviously going to be fair, right? Well, when society sees things, you'd think yes. For a mathematician, well, no. Have you proven that lemma? No. no. Why would it be true? It's obviously not true until you prove the lemma. Right? But you start waving a paper in front of a judge that says something about, where is it? Fairness through awareness, okay? So you start waving a, a proper technical paper in front of a judge and say, look, I proved this algorithm is fair. What's the chance the judge has a PhD in? In computer science, mathematics. Fairly low. Possible. <laughs> Possible. Fairly low. So all of a sudden, this carries immense weight. These are mathematicians trying to solve a problem made by mathematicians. Things get even worse. And actually, a sensible mathematician came along and said, well, you know, there's a paper talking about algorithmic fairness. And there's another one over here by some other authors, and they have slightly different conditions, and there's another one here, and another one here, all of their conditions are slightly different. So can we put these conditions together? The answer is yes, you can. And the question, next question is, okay, so which algorithm satisfy the, the, the combined conditions here? And the answer is no algorithm satisfies those combined conditions. You have arrows and possibility theorem for fairness. You can't put these, all of these conditions seem reasonable when you write them out, Okay, that kind of reflects what I think an aspect of fairness might be. Put them all together, just like Arrow's theorem for, for voting, there's no fair voting system apart from a dictatorship. Yes. <laughs> there's no fair algorithm that combines all these things. That's proven. So now you have to decide which of these conditions you think are the right conditions for fairness. You have to decide which are the right ones for fairness. And actually, one of the authors of this paper was explicitly asked, you know, how do you justify that these are the right conditions for fairness? Her response was, that's not our issue to think about. We leave that up to the ethicists. <laughs> that is a complete deferral of responsibility. I will do whatever I like, give me accolades for it, I'll produce math to look up proven fairness, but whoa, whoa, when, 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 when things start to get hot, it's not my problem. Let, let, the, let, the, let, let the ethicists sort, sort this out. <laughs> the ethicists. You have such a deep understanding of, of, of mathematics and computer science. I think I've told you this before. Google DeepMind has a team of 10 ethicists, none of whom have any mathematical or computational training. How can you trust an ethicist to tell you something about something like this? They have no idea. They have no idea what any of the words in this mean. Okay, maybe not, because my hand already started with it. But even if I could write this out properly, they have no idea what these words mean. 